Hi, Greg Ellis from the Illawarra Mercury for In The Loop and the people of Wollongong. And today we're talking to a gentleman who grew up in Wollongong, who has been described by the National Trust as a national living treasure. Dr. Carl Krizlnicki, welcome to In The Loop. I'm, I'm honoured. Thank you very much, Dr. Greg, for inviting me. Thank you. This segment is brought to you by Access Law Group and the Illawarra Mercury. First of all, I want to go back to the beginning. I understand you arrived in Wollongong when you were very young. Sure. So uh, we were refugees um, and uh, we escaped Europe and things were looking bad. Russia was threatening to invade into Finland. My father had already spent time in a Russian concentration camp, decided it was not really a future option. He wanted to explore again, seeing as how he'd escaped. And so we were going to be heading for the United States. Uh, I threw a fever in response to a smallpox vaccine. By the way, I love vaccinations. And so they, my parents panicked and the ship sailed away and the next ship was coming to Australia. So with our cardboard suitcases, we went onto the ship um, and ended up in Australia. Then and, um, grew up in a refugee camp on the border of New South Wales, Victoria, then a little time in Sydney, then down to wonderful Wollongong. So you were about five when you yeah, came? Yeah, some sort of age then, and it was, it was a totally different time. We're talking half a century ago, right? So if you were a woman and had a job and got resigned and then, and then got married, you had to resign. A married woman was not allowed mm. to have a job. If you were an Australian Aboriginal slash Indigenous person, you didn't exist. You didn't get counted on the census, you couldn't vote, and the job of the government was to try and break up your family and send all of you in different directions. I thought it was a different time back then. But the good thing about Wollongong was not just the beautiful climate and environment and lots of jobs available, but for me, the Wollongong Library. And I started off reading my way through fairy tales of the world, starting off at Afghanistan and going up to Zululand and there were about 140 of them and, and it was just amazing how similar and different they were and then I immediately got into science fiction and funny stuff like that and the librarians looked after me and at one stage one of the librarians said how would you like uh, to read this book and I said sure where, where is it and she gave me a box and there were unnumbered pages in random order. And this was some French existentialist guy's idea of what a book should be. And so the library looked after me and blew my mind. I also heard between either high school and university or after university before working uh, that you dug trenches or uh, sewer pipes with uh, picks and shovels around that day. Yeah, that? my father had a job there at the water board and because he could speak 12 languages he ended up in the personnel department, which now they, they call human resources, and so he would employ people, and so he spoke to one of the boss gangs, a guy called Stan Gifford. And there was one day we came in on a Monday morning, he said, did you see that movie, of the movie, the movie, did you see that movie, The Philadelphian, that starred Paul Newman, we were falling in love with Joanne Woodward or somebody, and um, he was from the wrong side of the tracks, an illegitimate child in love with an upper-class woman, you know, and the story goes on, blah, blah, blah. And, and he said, did you see that movie? I said, yeah. He said, do you remember what he said about working as a labourer? And I said, yeah. He said, honey, I'd even dig ditches if I could stay, if I meant I could stay with you. And he said, you, you, and he said, you saw that? And he said, and I quoted the line to him, and he said, yeah, now, do you know what that means? And I said, he dig ditches? Yeah, think about this. You're smarter than any of us, and you can go to university, because you are you're on your way to university. They call me the prof. Everybody who's going to go to university, they call the prof, because not many people went to university in those days. And he said, you can go to university, but none of us can. He said, look, people like me will never, ever have any job except labouring, but you can do anything you want. He said, I don't want you to ever forget that. And it just blew my mind. I, I, nobody had ever said anything like that to me before, and it stayed with me ever since. We all have different abilities. And back then, the society allowed people who were good at labouring, to have a labouring job. Now it doesn't. Now, you talked about uh, some of the challenges early on growing up in Wollongong. How do you think that shaped you for what you have become today? Well, um, I became uh, very non-racist. Well, my parents were very non-racist, so they um, influenced me a lot. Like at one stage, we were in Alice Springs. 
and we were, so my parents didn't have a car and they spent all their money on holidays and so we were out of the springs and my father would uh, give the Aborigines money for paintings or anything, but they'd say give us some money and the white people would say don't give the Aborigines any money, they'll just spend it. My father would say it's my money, I can do whatever I want with it because you could see the massive injustice where families were deliberately broken up. And there was a guy there called, not Albert Namajira, but another Namajira, who said, buy my paintings. My father said, sure. He said, you haven't even looked at the paintings. I'll buy them. And so I've got some non-Albert Namajira paintings, which my father passed on to me. And so that influenced me a lot. And also the Gat brothers at school influenced me a lot. They were Maltese. And I used to play tennis and I cheated in the sense that um, if the ball was in, I'd say it was out or vice versa, if it suited me and I could win the game because I was sort of competitive. Anyway, one day I'd finished playing a game with them and I rode home. And my parents said, how was the game of tennis? And suddenly instead of saying, I won 6-3 or whatever, I said, it was really good. And I realised that the having of the good time was completely independent of winning or losing. The winning and losing was just a number. You know, see, I won 6-5, I lost 6-5, it didn't matter. And at that moment, somehow I lost all my competitiveness against other people and I sort of picked up the internal competitiveness where you get with golf, where you're just trying to become as good as you can in yourself. And I, I got this different belief. I, I, I was just standing there, I my parents sort of talk about something else. I was thinking, wow, um, there's enough success to go around for everybody. I can succeed in being as good as I can and they can be as good as they can and it doesn't matter what the score was. And after that, I never cheated again. I never asked them if they know that I was cheating, but I'm sure they did. But Gat Brothers, look, thank you very much for teaching me about the kind of ridiculousness of cheating to compete because I, I never cheated again in any sport. Okay, looking back on your time in Wollongong, what sort of did you grow up in and what are your fondest memories looking back? Well, I've got, immediately say that I've got a memory of flashing my father with a mirror. So we were about half a kilometre from the hospital in what was called then West Wollongong in Hillcrest Street, really close. And my father went in for a kidney stone operation. And every morning when the sun was right, my mother and I would sit at home and he would sit on the veranda and we'd flash mirrors at each other and try and do primitive mes messages in Morse code. And then, of course, we'd go and see him in the afternoon. That was, that was really fun. And I, I loved growing up there near the ocean and the mountain. I loved the environment of being able to walk up Mount Kira. I loved doing that for fun. I loved the fact that it was just such a, a beautiful place in, in the world and, and it was easy, comfortable living. And the University of Wollongong at the time you were there, it was sort of uh, establishing itself and growing quite dramatically. I know yeah. you go back a fair bit now. Yeah. Talk, tell me about the changes that have occurred there and, and uh, what you think of the university now. Well, it started off as a very small university, as a branch of the University of New South Wales, and then kept on growing and getting bigger and bigger, and then turned into its own university. And now it has so many people doing world-class work. You've got the um, Gordon Wallace and all of his mates and the, and, and the medical faculty, there, there are dozens of, there's a dozen people there at least who are world leaders in their excellence and it's a really nice environment to do your study in. So it's changed enormously from you know, what it was back then to what it is now and it's a really nice place to live. I, I, I think it's a lovely university. Can you tell us about the book? Well, there's, um, we've got a copy of it over here somewhere. Slowly, right slowly, behind you. Right here. Oh, Exhibit A. So shamelessly copying the zeitgeist of the time, the doctor. So it's got three stories in there that are fairly longish and that you should know about. One is about gravity waves and how important they are. And the other one is about Bitcoin and there's another important, Bitcoin and the blockchain. Learn about the blockchain. It'll be like somebody coming to somebody else in the mid 80s and say, you know, these computers, they're gonna be really useful. What's a computer? Right, what's a mouse, right? So, and then there's another story. And then there's a whole bunch of short stories to sort of suck you in. Like um, a giant baby planet. We've actually seen a baby planet forming into existence. Or why do dogs, when they look at you, 
tip their head like that. And I can explain that in a simple way. So we're ready to do an experiment here. So here we go. So make your hand like a fist. All right, now put the fist on your nose. Can you see my face? Um, not really. Not really, no. Now imagine you're a dog with a long snout. Now tip your head. And now you can see my face. So in many cases, it seems that the dog is tipping its head when it looks at you, not to be incredibly cute, but just to be able to see what you want and be nice to you. And then there's a whole lot of other stories in here. Let me just practice, pick some out at high speed. Why is it that you can tell when the blood alcohol level at a party goes to about 0.03 by the noise level going up? And the answer is the alcohol makes you deafer it makes women slightly more deaf than men. And so because you're more deaf, to get the same apparent loudness from your voice back into your ears, you talk louder. And so they're not trying to be diabolical, they're genuinely slightly deafer. They can't hear as well. Dr. Carl, we want to thank you very much for your time on In The Loop today, thank you. It's an honour to be asked, thank you very much. In The Loop Wollongong is only possible because of the support of our partners. So please show some love to our media partner, I98FM. Our made possible by partners, Wollongong Central, Discover the City. Where we got these amazing threads to run from, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Relativity, not just taken, created. The University of Wollongong. Watch out for those ducks. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Advantage Wollongong. Destination Wollongong. Access Law Group, you want to use, but you don't want to use. Very smart people you can rely on. Them. Yes. Illawarra Mercury. Internet Tricks. Lancaster Law and Mediation. Kazen Business and Financial. Our promotional partners, who you can see here. And our kitchen partners, which you can also see here. And they keep us full fed. Thanks for watching, <laughs> and we'll see you next time on In the Loop Wollongong. Bye. Bye.